Thank you, <clears throat> Claude, and um, thank you to Jean-Michel for those introductions. Congratulations to the Institute for the organization of this State of the Union conference, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today, uh, particularly on a theme <clears throat> which, as Mario Monti and uh, President Barroso emphasized yesterday, is at the core of the agenda for Europe um, uh, and Europe's place in the world in the future. Um, <clears throat> as confirmed by the European Council in February last year, um, reconfirmed for the third time, uh, we want to move towards a competitive low-carbon economy in Europe by 2050. This is the centerpiece of Europe's uh, engagement with the rest of the world. But in making our contribution to addressing a, a global collective action issue, we can also transform our economy in, in ways which brings real and lasting benefits. So energy and climate policy in the European Union bring together the concepts of economic and uh, environmental sustainability in a vision for delivering lasting uh, uh, high living standards for citizens. Yet today in Europe, we seem to find ourselves in something of a bind. Many countries have uh, been facing fiscal unsustainability and some fear the transition to a more sustainable path has to be at the expense of investment and growth. Um, so the transformation of the energy sector can and must contribute to economic and fiscal sustainability through its contribution to um, its stimulus to growth and employment and its contribution to restoration of competitiveness and um, a, a tackling the increased uh, an import dependence which Europe is faced with. To help not just policymakers uh, realize uh, this, the needed need for transformation, but also investors and citizens, the European Commission has developed uh, a roadmap for energy by 2050. <clears throat> it stresses the much needed investment in energy generation, in transmission and distribution, uh, infrastructure and in energy efficiency, which must surely be uh, part of the solution to Europe's problems rather than an extension of them. And the main conclusion of the roadmap is simple. Developing the goal of uh, de delivering the goal of a competitive low carbon economy is feasible if we act now, if we use energy better, if we exploit renewable resources and other low carbon technologies fully, and if the EU acts together, and by doing that, it can make itself more competitive, more sustainable in, for its future as a whole. But once again, as in other policy areas, the European Union and its member states, its, uh, all the stakeholders involved have to weigh up the costs of action, which will be high, against the costs of inaction, which will arguably be higher in terms of lost opportunity and greater threats in the future, damaging climate change, uh, increasing investment needs, low competitiveness, lost jobs, lost growth, and increasing import dependence. How, though, does this revolution in the energy sector fit with the EU's long-standing goal of an internal market in energy? Will the phase of transformation of, uh, energy, of the energy sector require so much public intervention in markets that the market itself becomes only a residual influence on price? Will the need for national intervention to support the move to the low carbon economy simply refragment the wider European market to which we have devoted, as Lord uh, has already said, so much time and effort and packages create, creating it? We should certainly not fall into blindness 
or denial on these issues. There, will, there is and will be for some time a need to intervene in markets to correct for the obvious market failure insofar that market signals have ignored climate change. The issue is how the intervention is done, arguably at best where possible by market-based instruments such as ETS, and the commi Commission has recently committed itself to re a review of the functioning of that system, or where necessary by subsidy or regulation or targets which are necessary and proportionate to the challenge but are clearly transitional. No economy is sustainable if it is to be based on the expectation of permanent subsidy. But longer term commercial viability of new technologies may be necessary, um, uh, may, may justify support to achieve large scale application and reduce costs to competitive levels. We should also not be blind or ideological about whether all solutions needed in terms of market design are European ones. We have to argue the case and re-argue it. Um, to those who do not have the vision or the conviction of a Schumann as to why a European internal energy market makes sense. And let's be honest, the phrase internal market is inaccessible to the wider public, inaccessible to the public beyond the world of the EU institutions, regulators and industry players. And the outward impression of this market as it is in its form today with the regulation and regulatory structures around it is not one of simplicity and singleness. We have built an architecture around the markets of re national regulators and regulations and uh, a structure of systems operators as well as of agencies to make sure the markets work. And the word market generally is accompanied by the uh, desire that market players should be able to compete and trade and invest with the lightest possible regulation. Uh, and yet, to make markets work in the, initially, regulation is necessary. On the other hand, in this area, as hopefully we can see in as a number of other areas, it should be possible to offer the perspective of less regulation in the future as markets begin to work more effectively. And in arguing and re-arguing the case for the internal market, let's not forget the basic concept of an energy-dependent Europe open for business on the basis of an open, integrated, interconnected market in which trade in electricity and gas can take place freely on the basis of a common set of rules. And the advantages need no apology. A European market with cross-border trade opens up national markets to more competition in terms of price, quality and dependency, dependability of services and the capacity to integrate new innovative technologies to enter the market where necessary, whether in generation or smart infrastructures or in energy use. And the reality that in this area and in the context of uh, global trends in energy, we cannot deliver a reduction in price visibly compared with the past, shouldn't diminish the argument that uh, without this structure, these uh, the price trends would not only be more volatile, but also uh, certainly much higher. And secondly, a single set of rules, market, uh, market regulations and rules, which give investors and companies a solid and predictable framework for investments in the energy sector in Europe. So many times in the last five years, I have heard banking uh, representatives tell me the reason why we don't invest sufficiently in your concept of Europe and Europe single market in energy is that we don't believe you will overcome the 
obstacles to it. Thirdly, the capacity of companies to exploit the scale and scope of a market of some 500 million consumers to innovate, to grow, to create jobs, and to exploit the potential of a wider interconnected market in order to enhance security of supply and tackle challenges such as the intermittency of renewable sources. Putting in, in place the core components of internal market regulation and applying it as envisaged in the 2014 target is a precondition for these benefits to be realized. So too, however, is a rigorous enforcement of competition and state aid rules to ensure that no one um, is in a position to manipulate um, the, and uh, frustrate these benefits. And that includes the issue of price regulation at the retail level. There will be refragmentation of the market unless the Commission and national regulatory authorities are vigilant on these points. And regulation alone will not allow companies to innovate and compete um, without the needed investments in infrastructures to ensure that the reality of a, of a European-wide market is achieved. Now, much of the work which uh, we've been discussing in the last two years and will be the subject of debate today relates to the completion of the internal market at the wholesale level. It shows the importance of the toolbox of network codes and framework guidelines which the third package provide uh, in electricity, uh, successful price coupling. Um, a lot of this work is, is often detailed and many stakeholders are involved. But in the end, it should lead to a simpler and more transparent approach across Europe. Rather than 27 approaches, market participants should be faced with a co coherent and consistent rulebook. That doesn't mean by 2014 that every single comma and semicolon needs to be placed on every single network code, but the fundamental uh, codes necessary to ensure dynamic of competition on the market need to be there. The work means rules need to be put in place which recognize also the coming transformation of our system. And it means that in a fully functioning market, the special rules for renewable energy, such as priority dispatch, must be reviewed to make sure that they are still necessary when we get there. Likewise, in gas, we need to continue the work of integrating gas markets, building wider and deeper trading hubs, and improving the interaction between the gas and electricity markets. Ladies and gentlemen, achieving the internal market in regulatory terms is necessary, is complex, involves many, many stakeholders. But we can't forget the vision of the low carbon competitive economy which we're trying to create. Um, that low carbon economy needs to ensure system integrity. It needs to ensure full participation of all consumers and energy providers. And it needs to ensure that interventions to meet the important energy mix or security supply aims are coherent. This is why we need to look in this challenge, not just to the detail, but to the vision which was originally there and keep arguing the case for a single energy market in Europe. Thank you very much.